Some years ago, I was very struck by a passage I read by the noted preacher and translator of the Bible, Eugene Peterson. Peterson wrote, we underestimate God and we overestimate evil. We don't see what God is doing, and so we conclude he is doing nothing. We see everything that evil is doing, and therefore think it is in control of everyone. That was a really striking passage for me, and it expressed what I often feel. And I suspect in our challenging times, it's not difficult for many of us to fall into the temptation of underestimating God and overestimating evil. After all, one would, be, would have to be blind or delusional not to see how much is not going well in our world and even in the church. We are coming out, hopefully, of two years of pandemic with all the sickness, death, isolation, social division that that has brought about. As I speak, a brutal, senseless war is being waged in Ukraine. And because of social media, we can follow almost in real time the destruction, the deaths, the displacements that that unjust conflict has unleashed. We all live with so much uncertainty as to how all of this will play out and affect our lives. But I think precisely because it is so easy to underestimate God and overestimate evil, our prayer today on the resurrection, on the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is so terribly important. As we come to the end of this Lenten retreat, we're invited to pray over and to reflect on this central mystery of our faith. And so we might ask very simply for a deeper faith, a deeper conviction, a deeper understanding of the meaning of the resurrection of our Lord. We might ask the Lord to help us see what God has done in raising Jesus up for the dead, to help us see what God is doing in our world today, and to help us see how we ourselves might be called to work with the risen Lord for the healing and salvation of our world. I propose that we pray over three words, three words that sum up in some way the heart of the resurrection, hope, presence, and mission. First then, hope. What does the resurrection mean? Jesus unjustly put to death in the most barbarous and cruel way available to the Romans has been raised to unending life by the Father. Just to clarify, we're not talking about resuscitation. In the Gospels, Jesus brought many people back to life. The, the daughter of Jairus, the son of the widow of Nain, his friend Lazarus, but all those three had to face the dark door of death again. Not so with Jesus. As St. Paul says, we know that Christ raised from the dead dies no more. Death no longer has power over him. This is the heart of our faith. That through, our resurrection, through the resurrection, our God has revealed that evil and death do not and will not have the final word. The risen Lord is God's victory over sin and death. It's God's promise to us that love and goodness and life are our destiny. The resurrection invites us to live in hope, holding on to God's promise in Jesus. This hope of resurrection is not optimism. 
It's not some superficial Pollyannish view that, oh, things aren't really so bad and it'll all come out all right in the end. The darkness is real. Injustice is real. The tragedies that people have to face are real and cannot and should not be trivialized. But believing in Jesus' resurrection means, to put it somewhat inelegantly, that light is more real, that goodness is more real, that life is more real. Christian hope, as St. Paul says in the letter to the Romans, is always a hoping against hope. And I love the way Pope Francis described hope in his famous TED talk in 2017. Pope Francis said, to Christians, the future does have a name, and its name is hope. Feeling hopeful does not mean to be optimistically naive and to ignore the tragedies humanity is facing. Rather, hope is a virtue of a heart that doesn't lock in, doesn't lock itself into darkness, but is able to see you tomorrow. Let me repeat that. Hope is a virtue of a heart that doesn't lock itself into darkness, but is able to see you tomorrow. This hope, this hope which is not mere optimism, this hoping against hope doesn't come naturally. I think it has to be the fruit of prayer. I suspect in the end that this hope comes to life in us only when, like the disciples in the Gospels, we actually encounter the risen Lord and hear him say to us in our hearts, as he said to the women at the tomb, do not be afraid. And perhaps that's the reason why in the spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius invites us to pray over so many stories of resurrection appearances of the risen Lord to his friends. All these stories begin with profound despair, with disorientation, a sense that there's no longer a future. And in each of them, St. Ignatius says, the risen Lord fulfills what Ignatius calls the office of consoler, as friends are accustomed to consoling one another. Consolation for Ignatius is a technical term. It doesn't mean just making somebody else feel better. Consolation for Ignatius means an increase of faith, of hope, and of love. In other words, in each of these stories, the risen Lord transforms the burdensome sense that life has come to a dead end to a sense of new beginnings, new possibilities. And I think Ignatius invites us to enter into these gospel appearances, to contemplate them precisely so we too can meet, can encounter, can come into personal contact with the risen Lord who is not just an idea, not even our best idea, but who is a living person. That's the first suggestion for prayer then, that we pray over these resurrection appearances and enter into the despair of the disciples and hopefully meet the risen Lord who says, peace, do not be afraid. A second suggestion based on the second word. The second word for the resurrection after hope is presence. It's interesting that in the Acts of the Apostles, as we hear the apostles going about spreading the gospel, there's never a sense that the disciples miss Jesus, which is kind of strange. One would think that after having spent three intense years with this most remarkable of teachers and friends, they would feel his absence very keenly. There is none of that in the Acts of the Apostles, and I think there is none of that for a very good reason. 
Jesus is no longer with them as he was, but through his spirit, through the spirit of the risen Lord, Jesus continues to be with them. That's why they don't miss him, because he's there. His seeming absence is actually a new way of presence. As the risen Lord tells his friends on the mountain in Matthew 28, know that I am always with you, even to the end of the age. Presence, a second word we might reflect on as we pray over the mystery of Easter. One of the most fascinating aspects, however, of the Easter stories is that they don't recognize Jesus right away. Um, on the shore, uh, when Jesus appears to Peter and his disciples were fishing, they think he's a stranger. Mary Magdalene, who's weeping uh, because she thinks that somebody has stolen the body of Jesus from the tomb, sees Jesus, he's standing right in front of her and he thinks she, he's the gardener. In the story of the two disciples running to Emmaus in Luke 24, Jesus walks with them, enters into conversation, and the two guys have no idea who is beside them. I think this is profoundly um, important for us because all the stories seem to be telling us that the risen Lord continues to be with us, but the primary spiritual challenge is to recognize him, is to recognize his presence. And so a suggestion for prayer might be precisely Luke 24, 13 to 25, that beautiful story of the risen Lord walking with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Again, the story begins with utter despair. The two disciples are running away from Jerusalem, leaving the community, their dreams and hopes shattered by the death of Jesus. We had hoped that he would be the one to save us, to set Israel free, they say. We had hoped. And then unbidden, the risen Lord walks with them, accompanies them. The two have no idea who the stranger is. He compassionately listens to their story, their frustration, their grief, their hopelessness. He opens their minds using the scriptures, placing their experience within the wider story of God's plan and helping them discover the meaning of their experience. He accepts their hospitality, stay with us, it is nearly evening, they say. And in the gathering darkness, as he breaks the bread, suddenly it is light. St. Luke says their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Scripture scholars tell us that one dimension of the story is precisely to remind the early church where they might continue to experience the presence of the risen Lord. In the word of God, in the breaking of the bread or the Eucharist, and in the strangers who accompany us in our moments of darkness. We might pray over this passage and ask the Lord to open our eyes to recognize him, to see his presence in our lives, to help us recognize and realize that we do not walk and we will not walk in this dark world alone. Finally, mission. A common element in all the appearance stories is that those who experience the consoling presence of the risen Lord are commissioned to be witnesses, to share the hope that has visited them. In some stories, there isn't even a need for an explicit command. As we saw in the story of Emmaus, uh, the two disciples spontaneously, their hearts burning, leave the inn and rush back to Jerusalem to share the wonderful experience they've had. There's no need for a command. They're just so filled with joy 
at the experience of meeting the risen Lord. But the point is, this is a fundamental aspect of our Easter faith. The call to share somehow the hope that we experience in Jesus risen from the dead to a world so terribly in need of it. You know, what's very striking, and I suggest that we can use this in our prayer too, is that the first witnesses are women, the women who come to the tomb on Easter morning. Think especially of Mary Magdalene, whom St. Thomas Aquinas calls the Apostolorum Apostola, the Apostle to the Apostles. The fact that the risen Lord chose women in our Lord's time not legally qualified to be witnesses, to be his witnesses of the most important thing in his ministry and life, says something of the new world the Lord is trying to bring about by his resurrection. A world of equal dignity and communion and hope for all who are somehow marginalized or devalued. But I'd like to suggest that we pray over these women, taking Matthew 28, 1 to 10, probably, as a possible text. Because they speak to us in a very powerful way of how we might be called to serve in a world where the problems are so enormous and seem to overwhelm us. Facing a still unresolved pandemic, this ongoing war, this global environmental crisis, where does one begin? The list of challenges could go on and we can feel so powerless and overwhelmed. The women who went to the tomb on Easter morning felt the same way. What could they do? It was all over, Jesus was dead. In Mark's version, as they're walking, they asked themselves, Who's going to help us roll the stone away from the tomb? But as Pope Francis loves to point out, while the men remain locked in the upper room, unable to do anything, these women, moved by love, moved by the courage of love, did what they could do. They knew they couldn't do everything, but what they could do, they could do to express their love they would offer this final servant service of anointing to their master. And as a result, they encountered the risen Lord. A young French Dominican, Adrien Candier, has written a marvelous little book in which he argues that hope is not optimism, but rather courage. The courage to love the courage to transform situations that we meet every day with love. The courage to love and to transform concrete situations by our acts of love. Amidst the death and destruction around us might not be a bad way to express our Easter mission and might be worth praying over. Hope, presence, mission. We pray over these three words as we thank the Lord for the gift of the resurrection. May we all encounter the risen Lord in our prayer. May we see what he, he has done. May we see what he is doing in our world. And may we see what he is calling us to do with him to bring hope and healing to our world.